the tutorial. It's perfect timing. So I think that science is to do like design to have an educational user reference. For GitHub. Yeah. I my personal account, um, I, I think you can do that. But a this is a recent change with the um, the um, organization level accounts. I think I also have applied, and I may even have credentials for an educational account, but I've never used it really. I think so. I think Harper Adams also has GitLab. Is that right, Matt? Or code they used base. to? What is it called? Code base. Code base. So a GitHub-like re repo that Harper uses. I don't know if it's um, because I'm, I am a very practical person. Those of you who know me probably uh, could see that. I consider myself a very practical person, but I could never bring myself just for practical reasons to use a code tool like this that somebody else administrates. It just uh, would not happen. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust the administration to somebody else for code that it was part of my work that I invested my time into. So my own admin, admin of my own GitHub is a good solution and that wouldn't be a solution for me. Okay. <clears throat> I'm eating cupcakes at the same time. Apologies to the people listening online. <laughs> OK. So this is the new website that um, demonstrates the use of. Um, of um, Porto. Of the end product, but we're going to dig a little deeper for this tutorial. I've made a couple of um, posts over here. I've made an about page. Uh, I've made a sidebar navigation menu, but you can you can designate the shape of your navigation menu um, as you wish. And you can organize it any way as you wish, and it's very, very easy to do it. The documentation is also um, a lot like documentation for other RStudio um, sites and products, is that it's very good, it's very simple, and it's very effective. In fact, um, of any website, um, of any markdown based website I've ever seen, it's, it's far easier from from writing the code to having a website than any other solution that I've seen. OK. So if you want to follow along, you can click over on the um, 221051 and I'll just drop this in the chat. If people do want to follow along. Now, um, for for prep, if you people have planned to uh, follow along, if you want to just watch, that's fine too. We'll see how much we can get through in uh, in time. Since we're meeting in person today, I think we could go a little bit later if people want to and want to stay. So I I plan to start from scratch a website and have a website up before the end. We should be able to do that in about an hour. And if I find that I'm talking too much um, and I'm too far behind, I'll stop talking <laughs> as much. <clears throat> Here's the prep you need. You'll need the latest version of our studio. We can't skimp on that because Quarto is a new product. You'll also need the latest version of Quarto. I actually don't think I've installed it on this laptop, but I'll, I'll be able to see if I have installed it on this laptop in a second when I start our studio. You need to have a GitHub account, obviously. And you need to have the uh, latest version, at least for my workflow, the workflow I'll show you. Um, I'm using GitHub Desktop. I use that most of the time because I'm kind of lazy and I, I don't use Linux day to day. I have it parts of my life, but I just don't do it anymore. And GitHub Desktop is easy for me to use. So I use that and I'm going to show you that. So the GitHub set, set up. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is make that GitHub organization. I'm going to make a GitHub organization for the module C7041 because I have I have an existing website for it, but I don't have a new Porto website for it, and I want to have one. So I'm, I thought I'd just set up a skeleton one today with you. So let's do that first. Let's go to um, GitHub. I'm going to um, just sign in. Um, <clears throat> so 
I'm going to sign in with my email. See if I can remember my Git password. <laughs> Maybe I'll still remember it. Nope. OK, I'm going to have to look it up. So I'm going to unshare for just a moment. I'll be right back after I go to my passwords. <clears throat> Can I create a free organization from with from within my account? Yes. Because I'm locked as my account. Yeah. Yes. That's what we're gonna do. Yeah. We're gonna do it together. Yeah, you can do it. You I can. Be, you can more. rush ahead. It's fine. <laughs> I can't stop you. You totally can. That's the beauty of this thing. That is the beauty of this thing. <laughs> is that uh, I'll come look in just a moment. I'll just come look in just one moment. Is that your GitHub desktop? So you need to log on to GitHub online on through the browser as well. Do that first. Oh, I see where I was going wrong. Better close that. Okay. Reshare. Gonna reshare. Logged in. <clears throat> there we go. All right, so I'm logged in now to GitHub. Now, this is my personal GitHub account. Is everybody with us? Um, so I uh, want to follow what I've written as well. So the first thing that we want to do is just create a GitHub organization, okay? And and all you need is, um, I, I would use my personal email from my personal GitHub account. That would be the easiest thing for us all to do. Um, so that's what I'm going to do for this example. So I'm going to go up to this little plus sign up here in the upper right. New organization. I'm now on the free team or enterprise page, so I get to choose whether you want a free one or a pay one. Now, the benefit you get for a paid one is you get to add lots of team members and have extra space, storage space. But for a little little old data science website, you'll never run out of, you'll never need a lot more people than a free one. So for this one, I'm gonna call it, um, C7041 2022 with just two twos. There we go. And the contact email is going to be the same as my um, main GitHub account. I'm going to call it my personal account and I'm going to verify the puzzle. It'll probably ask me whether I can identify the spiral galaxy. <laughs> yes. Okay, I've done it a few times recently. Here we go. OK, and now it adds a, it asks if I want to add members. OK, if people are doing along for this, I'm going to take a bite of my cupcake and then continue. So the name of the organization is the, your personal uh, account name of the. So, OK, for me, it says it is already taken. Mm -hmm. Now, what the name of the organization you want to put in when you have a GitHub account? Your account name acts as part of the a subdomain to be the URL for all of your repositories. So, it, for most people, it would be something like GitHub.com. For me, it's GitHub.com/slash we Harris. That's uh, I think it's um, weh9000 or something like that. We Harris. What your domain, what your organization name will do is act as that same domain folder name for uh, for the location of your organization repositories. So you want to pick a name like a folder name. It'll have to have enough characters that nobody else in the world has taken it. So 
you know, we all know the little tricks we want to do, but you also might want to make it a, a name that has meaning. And, you know, so for me, I've named this one C7041 slash 2022. Next year, if some joker doesn't take 2023, guess what I'll call it? <laughs> um, so pick, you do have to pick more. I've, I found that uh, small names, short names, maybe it rejects them automatically because I, I doubt that so many organizations are taken. I've, I tried some random characters with like five numerals and character combinations and they weren't accepting that. So maybe there are some rules that I don't know about. So um, the nice thing too is for the purposes of this, pick any name. You can just delete your organization later. Just just pick some characters or put together dog, truck, horse, puppy kind of uh, name if you wish. But you probably with just a few seconds can pick out something that works. So I'm going to skip the step of um, adding people for now. And they have a little questionnaire, which um, out of politeness, let's just answer it. So I'm going to spend... Um, most of my time writing code, planning projects, more and more administration, I can say that, managing and coordinating engineer work, I'll say none of that. How many people do I expect? One to five. Um, what type of work? Open source, education, personal. Um, other, and I'll say work as well, sure. Other, no. Choose up to three. I'm gonna manage code, collaborate on code, and plan and track work. Okay. Do I have an existing repo? No. Submit. Okay. Now for my other um, organizations, you know, from here you can set it up and personalize it if you wish. What it knows now is that I'm an individual. I'm not a business. It knows now an email address. It's the same one as for my personal repos. <coughs> and it knows a little bit of that questionnaire. It doesn't know anything else, so you can fill in as much information here as you want. One thing that I am going to fill in later, if I, we have time and if I remember, I don't, I'm not sure that I did say this, is uh, in, under your general settings for your repo, you have a place for a URL for your website, and you'll want to recursively, once we make a website, you'll want to recursively tell it for your organization that this is your website. It's just a nice little, little thing. You might want to upload a logo. I've up, I'll upload a logo for the modules as a visual cue for students and myself as well. Um, and let me just show you just briefly. Um, I'm gonna, uh, can I open that in a new page? No, I'm just going to open in a new page. W.E. Harris on GitHub. <clears throat> I just wanted to show you what my own personal page looks like. And so now we can see that I've got some repos. I've got some activity. You can see that's the beginning of the term. I've been busy. And uh, you can see down here my organizations that I have. I have a research organization that's on TuberScan called Yield Oracle. I have a class that I just finished last week, the statistical learning class. I have the Herrig website, which I've called Harper um, Data Science. I have a, a boot camp one that will be the new boot camp site. And then I have the one I just made. OK, so this is what it'll look like. So if we go back here, I'm just going to leave it. Um, if I just go back a page, um, I clicked settings and I'm going to park the page here on settings and then we'll come back to it in a second. So I'm going to go back to the tutorial now. And I think I made a mistake in the name. You can't make a mistake. You can't make a mistake because you can change the name. Yeah, how do I change it? I would say let's let's leave the name for now and we'll come back and we can change it later because we could do all sorts and 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 um, we could come up with a good name or we could fix the error that you think you made. <clears throat> OK, so. Um, so we've made our new organization. We've um, chosen 
um, to create a free one and we've made a name and we've given it our email. So first thing we're going to do is um, create a, a repository. And we're going to make it public <clears throat> and so forth. So um, now you, you may or may not choose to uh, follow me exactly here. You can be creative, but if you want to follow the exact code that I do, go ahead and call your repo website, all lowercase. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go back to my main account page. I'm going to click on my repository name. There's a link up here in the upper left, just up here. And I'm going to go to repositories and I'm going to click on repositories. I don't have any repositories, but I'm going to make a new repository, my first one in the new organization. Notice that um, notice that there is a um, a um, folder name that will be part of the URL <clears throat> for your uh, repo, and then just come up with a repo name. I'm going to call it website all lowercase. We're going to make it public. <clears throat> um, and let me just go down here. Now there, there's a thing that GitHub does to be aware of. You can forget this. I'm just going to say it verbally. And if we follow along, we do it together. Even if we make a mistake on this part, we can we can always fix it. But there is a since we're a mixed group of um, quasi computer scientists, I'll say this: that uh, one of the one of the things that uh, Linux operating systems and web servers tend to do is um, to as a shortcut, as a hack for um, for passing information um, for the for the parameters of a particular site. One one there are many little hacks, but one of the tricks is to put a pl as a placeholder and a, a hidden file. And by tradition, the hidden files have a naming convention. They start with a period, a dot. So um, one of the one of the um, hidden files that they're mentioning here is one of the um, uh, is git ignore. We're not going to go into that today, but one of the hidden files we will add in a second. It just reminded me to say this is um, the way that GitHub pages um, convert code to markdown code to uh, HTML is with a system called Jekyll. And now we have heard about Jekyll in here before. Joe Roberts, I think, talked to us about Jekyll. But uh, we'll have to add a hidden file. We'll do it programmatically, but we'll have to add a, get a hidden file for Jekyll. It'll be dot no Jekyll with no contents in the um, in the hidden file. Now uh, I'm just going to leave the license for now. It's something we can edit later. Um, you know, if you if you think somebody is going to you want to make this for business applications, you can put an MIT license. If you just want um, some kind of credit for somebody using your stuff. You can put a CC um, in some form. If you want to do something else, do something else. I'm going to leave it license free at the moment. Um, and I'm not going to add a README. README open is a little bit of a can of worms when you're making a website on a GitHub pages repo. Um, the README pages are a nice way, if you have a normal repo that's not going to be a website, to have a markup version of just some some uh, formatted information in Markdown um, that's converted by Jekyll usually to an HTML page. So here we don't want that because we're just going to have a web page. It won't be a README. OK, so I think that's all that we need to do. Questions? OK, we don't need a description. We don't need anything else. So I've named it website, made it public. We're ignoring everything else, and I'm hitting create repository. OK. Uh, now, uh, we don't need to give access to anybody. Let's just not touch the web page again. Let's go back to the tutorial. OK, so I've just gone through all of this verbally with this picture. And um, uh, now what we want to do is to bring our repo local. Now, there are many ways to do this. If you already use GitHub and you already have a flow for how you use GitHub, by all means, do it your way. But I'll tell you my way, and then I'll demonstrate my way. 
and if you have some variation on it and we want to talk about it, we can certainly talk about it. My way is this. I work on um, two desktops almost every day, and every other day I work on a laptop, this one. Occasionally I work on a third desktop and a second laptop. Okay, that's my workflow. I have five computers I regularly use every week, approximately. Now, to manage my files locally, um, I use Dropbox. That's my choice. I've used it for many years. Um, I have never run out of space uh, on it, even with ambitious use of it. And I, I use it a lot every day on all those computers. I have had some mistakes that I've had to correct using Dropbox on all those places. But it's nothing, it's nothing I can't handle. And the little cost of occasionally making a mistake is far outweighed by the utility of it. Now with GitHub, I don't have to use Dropbox because I can just clone down the repo any old place that I want. My way of doing things though is that GitHub works perfectly well with, with um, Dropbox to manage my local copy of it. So if I'm working at home on a repo and I forget to push, I can go push it home. I have had a few mistakes with this, so I'm just telling you that's the way that I do it, and that's the way I'm going to show you. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to set up um, GitHub Desktop. Let me just open it up. Uh, just occurs to me, I did actually, I took none of my own advice, actually. Um, I'm not even sure GitHub Desktop is on this computer. <clears throat> I'll have to install it real quick. Sorry about that. <clears throat> this is a fairly new laptop that's not really in my uh, rotation of, uh, of stuff. So, yeah, if you haven't done it, I'm um, just going to download it. A nice thing about GitHub de Desktop while I while I download it is that um, it's not it's not as powerful or as fast as all command line Git. But what it does for me is it because I have a complicated array of um, repos and several GitHub accounts, um, GitHub Desktop is just the easiest way for me not to have to have the burden of complete responsibility for where my where my console is pointing at a particular time. And also, I, I have to say, because I work on a lot of projects, some of them mine and some of them other people, it's nice to have the visual cue of, of the desktop too. So maybe it makes me less hardcore, but I really like um, GitHub desktop. <clears throat> so it's firmly in my workflow. Let's wait for it to download. It seems to be going slow. Another thing I like about it is if you have multiple accounts, um, this is, I have a love hate relationship with this, but it is easy at the end of the day is it, it allows me to, um, it manages uh, your login through a web browser. I use Chrome. Um, GitHub Desktop plays really well with Chrome. An annoyance with it, if you have multiple accounts, is you have to manually update your login through the web, so you have to go between ones, but that won't affect us today. All right, so I'm going to install. thinking. Here we go. <clears throat> it's launching. Now when I hit sign in, uh, it should detect that I am signed in. Yep. <clears throat> OK, great. So um, <clears throat> just going to finish. And I don't want to create any repositories <clears throat> yet. Let's go back to the tutorial. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to get the, um, we're going to, um, let me see. Um, there are about 10 ways to do this. I'm just trying to remind myself of which way that I decided I was going to demonstrate doing it. OK, from GitHub Desktop, make a local path for the repo. Yeah, OK. So um, what I think I intended there is the way that is native in my thinking to do it is I'm going to go ahead and um, go back to my repo site that we parked. And just click up in the space bar and grab the URL. 
So I'm just going to copy that. Then I'm going to go back to GitHub Desktop. <clears throat> and uh, it's asking me if I want to clone a re repository from the internet. Now this interface, since I have just installed it, is a little bit different than some of the pictures that you may see. There we go, this is the same as the pictures. So um, what I'm gonna do is click over on URL. That'll allow me to point it to the repo we just made. It's an empty repo we just made. I'm gonna paste it in. Now that'll just work if I just click go, but remember, I have a workflow. I'm very set in my ways, very conservative in the way I manage my files. This uh, path, this local path <clears throat> down here is one that I want to change. So it, it's putting it by default to wherever it points for default, but I'm going to choose mine and the place that I choose. So my little system is that I'm going to go to uh, my, the top, of my Dropbox, and I'm going to make a new folder. Now, uh, the way that I index it here is because I have a lot of folders, I'm going to index it by git dash, then the name of my repo. That inside my re inside my, I mean, the name of my account rather, and then inside my account is where my repository will live. So this one will be, it will create a folder called website the name of my repository. Let me just do it and then I'll say it again what I've just done if you're not sure about that. So first I'm going to um, make a new folder called git dash the name of my organization. So for me that is uh, we can see it you know if you've done it in exactly the same way. Uh, C7041-2022 Now it's, um, I haven't opened that folder. Down here it's selected that folder and I'm going to have it select that folder. So now um, it will be hard for you to see sitting there. You might be able to see it better on your, on your teams, but you can see that um, the place it's going to make it in the local path is in my Dropbox folder, git dash the name of my organization slash the name of the repo. It's automatically populated with the name of the repo I'm cloning, cloning which is website. So I'm going to hit clone. Now I could talk a long time about um, GitHub Desktop, but I'm going to talk very little about it. We have talked about it in here before, but uh, since we haven't got any local changes, we can see um, up here in the upper left that we've got our um, repo. And when I make any changes in the repo, what's going to happen is that um, those changes will update. We'll have a, vi a visual representation of the files. And if we choose one of the files, we'll have a visual representation of the changes inside the files. So it's pretty nice. There are some web tools that do something similar, but I haven't found anything as nice that I prefer using to get up desktop. OK, let's go back to the tutorial. So if we just look in our local directory, what we should now see inside the folder, I just open this up, go to my um, Dropbox, go down to my Git folders. I should have a new Git folder. There it is. I'm just going to open it up. Bam. I've got the one folder in it called website. I'm just going to open it up. Bam. There's nothing in it. <clears throat> I haven't even got a, um, a Git marker in it because I haven't done anything yet. Sorry, may I have a question because I probably cloned uh, it without uh, showing the exact localization. Where is it now? Is it uh, is that um, a repository uh, which I cloned into the GitHub local? Where is it kept now? Is it staying local and requires pushing? Yes. So yeah. I don't very much feel it. I because I, I use it. It feels like you've done it's nothing. Local, slightly different. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let me say what is just, if you've done, let me say what I have done. Yeah. And then if we need to, I'll come over there and say that you've done the same thing. Yes. <laughs> okay, so what I have done is I went online in the cloud. 
I, I had a space in the cloud that's my organization. It's an account in GitHub. I created a folder inside that account online in my browser called that website. There's no contents to it, but now, now GitHub is listening. So if there are any changes that I ask of it or send to it or take from it, then I'll have a record of that. So it's a GitHub repo. Then what I've done is I've gone down to my local computer and I've said, all right, local computer, I'm going to clone a, a, a repo online. And, um, and it said, fine, where is it? I've pointed to the place where that folder lives and I've told it, I, I changed on my computer where I wanted it. That's the bit about the GitHub folder or the um, Dropbox folder. And I changed the name for it. Now for yours, uh, here's a, a filthy, just a filthy way of testing where you've done it is we could um, clone a repository and it'll show you the de default local path and that's where yours will be. <laughs> Another way to do it would be to, uh, I think there might be a way to do it. Um, no, maybe not. <laughs> so you'll have to do it that filthy way. Clone repository. Yeah. Uh, okay, documents GitHub. Yes. GitHub. So it's, yeah. There we go. Okay, let's forge bravely forward and we'll take a break in a few minutes and we can go catch everybody up if we need to take a break. Um, <clears throat> so um, now uh, I don't know how often in your workflow creating a R Studio project is. Now, if it's a small, if it's a small thing, and often if I'm doing something in, in, uh, in one of these meetings in Herrig, I won't bother making a project. But if I know that I'm going to have more than a couple of files, my, my rule is I have a I have a very loose rule. But my rule is if I'm going to have more than two script files, two script files I can live with. More than two, I make a project. So what a project does is it remembers where your working directory is. It remembers where your data is. If you have folder structure and you have multiple data files, it remembers that for you. Um, and it does some other things, like it remembers the versions of repositories. So if you have need to do any of that stuff, always make projects. Here's how easy it is. If you open up our studio, I can almost guarantee I will have to install Quarto on this. <clears throat> Let's see what I've got here. I'm going to close this, close this. OK, and project none. OK, so let's go back to the tutorial. So um, <clears throat> what we can do, if I just make this a little bit bigger so everybody can see. If um, if I go to our studio and create a new project and, and choose um, existing directory, <clears throat> I can go to the to the um, to the uh, local repo folder. So if I go up here and click on the file menu, the new project. An existing directory. And I'm going to uh, browse to the repo folder, the website folder in the organization folder that I just made. So I'm going to, for me, that's going to go to my Dropbox folder. Git, and there it is. There we go. Okay, project from existing directory, is it? Yep, yeah. So uh, it's asking me if I want to open my new project in a new session. There's no harm in doing that, but um, I don't need to do that because there's nothing in that folder and there's nothing in my current R workspace. And uh, now we have a very tidy but subtle set of hints in our studio. If you look in your bar up here and you look in the drop down menu in the upper right, <clears throat> you'll see a little tip of the hat to the fact that we're now in a project workspace and everything's being automatically remembered. 
and, and likewise down here the file menu has has clicked to our working directory automatically as well. It's, it's very nice once you learn, just get used to exploiting what our studio does for you. OK. So um, <clears throat> the um, the first thing we're going to do, I'm going to just make sure I've got Quarto. And if not, see new file. Oh, I do have Quarto. That's good. I've installed it. All right, so um, I decided to do this, um, and this is partly based on, um, you can do this manually through the menus in our studio if you have everything up to date with the latest installation. But, but actually it's so, so easy to do it programmatically, I decided to, to show this. It sets up everything and it just works. So uh, if we go, let me just show something. I don't have a script open at the moment. And notice we have a, con a console, and if you if you watch the RStudio interface very carefully, you will have noticed um, around a year ago we started getting a terminal in it, and the terminal emulates yeah, have everything, take it all. There you go. Uh, the terminal emulates a Linux um, or a console um, terminal in uh, Windows. I see that I haven't installed the Linux um, version of this. I see I've got the Windows version. So this is the same as if you bring up a command prop. Uh, and if you install um, a Linux terminal, you can point our studio at Linux. I may have to, um, if I didn't include it, I think I did include the commands for Windows and for, for Linux here. So, um, so maybe that I'm not up to date with my R studio installation on this laptop. <clears throat> OK, so um, in the terminal, see if it works in the Windows version, we can uh, use this command. We're going to invoke. Let me make this a little bit bigger so everybody can see. And then later on the video, notice when I zoom in, um, it changes the formatting, but it also collapsed the sidebar. It's just a nice little thing that's automatic in the JavaScript that um, that we're doing here. So um, the command is quarto create dash project dash dash type. It's a flag. We're going to make a website. So you can just copy and paste that in, or if you're brave, you can you can type it in. So I'm going to copy that. Go to my terminal. So in the terminal, we have to right click. To paste. Yes. I'm not getting like the terminal bar. The console bar. Let me come back to you in just a moment. Uh, it might be how when's the last time you updated our studio? Well, I just did updates and it's saying that I've got the latest. It does say you have the latest. Have you installed Quarto? Quarto may uh, smuggle it in there for you. Let me um, let me do this and then we'll take a break and uh, we'll get everybody caught up. So let's first uh, I want to talk about this command because this is this is quite a powerful command before I just execute it and we can specify different types here. So if you wanted to make a book down site, if you wanted to make a blog type installation, you can look on the Quarto documentation and you would specify that here. We've picked website. Another um, option is between the create dash project command and the dash dash type flag. You could tell it where you want to create it. So if we didn't already have the repo um, folder, we could tell it there to do it. Let's just see what happens. Bam. So we get some output, and the output is um, that we've created um, several files. One is uh, the underscore quarto.yml file. And we've talked about YAML files in here before. <clears throat> uh, YAML, this is the Windows dot three characters version of YAML. YAML is a um, what com what computer scientists call a recursive acronym. YAML stands for YAML ain't 
markdown language. And what YAML files do are that they provide very high level instructions, usually in combination with, um, you see the last file, styles.css, cascading style sheets. Usually YAML files are very, very terse instructions for formatting and for large structural automated processes for, for web production or typesetting on the web. So we've got our four files. Also notice down here in the um, files menu that we've got those four files also. And if we go to GitHub Desktop, just to make sure we're all on the same page, we've noticed that we've got our four files in there. So those are the updates, but we're just going to leave it for now. We're not going to play with that for now. Um, should we take a break for five minutes and we'll get everybody caught up in person? Are there any questions uh, for you guys online? How are you doing? It's five o'clock, so we're out. We're technically out of time, but we're going to keep going and get the website up today. So if you need to leave, we'll keep recording. We're going to take a five minute break and make sure everybody's up to speed. So I'm just going to pause my microphone. Make make sure you remind me. Yell in chat if I forget to unpause it when I come back. I'm just going to be five minutes.
I'm, I'm still getting through mine, but they are nice, aren't they? Okay, so we've, we've had a little technical issues, but we're going to continue. Okay, so we've got our files. Let's go back to the tutorial and just see where we are. So, um, just like um, just like uh, we expected, let, let me let me go through a couple of these um, these folders. I mean, these files rather, and just say a, a few remarks about them. The YAML file I mentioned, and it's going to have a few instructions, and that to to um, to impact and change the big elements, the structural both function. Sorry. Oh, I did turn the mic on. I think. Can you? Yeah, my my my. That's the uh, one on this computer, but my my mic on the laptop is working. But thank you for reminding me. Yell if you're listening on here. If you can hear me, why don't you put a Y in the chat if you can hear me? I think I think it's on though. Um, <clears throat> so the uh, the YAML file will make. Thank you. The YAML file will make. Um, big structural changes, aesthetic ones and functional ones to your website. Now, um, the index.qmd, QMD is the um, is a Quarto markdown document, QMD Quarto markdown. So it's just markdown code. There are some peculiarities with Quarto markdown. The flow that I've been going with, are I've just been using plain old markdown, but I also, maybe we'll see it today, maybe not, I also like to use raw HTML tags, and it will accept them exactly um, like I give them. And I also still um, very extensively in my workflow when I'm creating especially um, education materials or a scientific manuscript, we use LaTeX um, to, to format equations. And, and it, it works perfectly with them. There are a few formatting tricks that are web tricks. So these are things like, um, like formatting um links and and pictures but they're also much easier than any system i've ever used before so we'll come across a few of those and i'll point them out now it's got two quarto markdown documents and it's got a styles.css sheet um, the cascading style sheet is a series of formats that uh, impact the aesthetics the colors the font the size of headings things like that now i haven't delved into that i think it was george that gave us a CSS talk one time. You showed us some some CSS. I think I think it was you that, that went into that because I've never done it. It, it. it's it frightens me. CSS is too complicated for a mere statistician like myself. But what I have done is I have um, is I have um, uh, they have a flag which we'll we'll look at. It. They have a flag in the YAML file where you can pick and choose the aesthetics yourself of your own website. The thing I haven't shown you on the website is I, I did do something a little fancy. This is really stepping out for me uh, with my uh, missionary tastes is uh, there's a little button over here. So I picked two styles for this website and we can go, we can go light or dark and I'll let the user choose. And I also picked two aesthetics that were, um, or inclusive for dyslexic readers uh, as well. So if you want to stick with something like that, my YAML will do that. OK. So um, <clears throat> so we've got our files. Let's go back to the um, to the tutorial. We have already examined the files that have come out and uh, we've we've got everything as it is. But the, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to um, we're going to um, edit the YAML file. Uh, and the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at our YAML file. So just open it up. And what you can see is that um, it's not very long. This one is 20 um, lines long, including four blank lines. And uh, the indentation is very important in, in YAML files, uh, even one space out and it won't. Um, it, it will reject you hard it will it will put you on the ground so uh, project website and format are important structural sections our project type is website automatically generated our website title is website so we might want to give this a different name 
I'm just going to call it C7041 um, for now. Uh, I've chosen, I, I haven't altered the width, the nav bar. We'll look at what this does in just a second. Um, <clears throat> but um, the default nav bar aligns to the left on a ribbon at the top of the page. This is the default. I have altered the one on, on my web page that I showed you to be a, uh, a docked type of sidebar with different buttons. And um, <clears throat> we get a, uh, a um, hyperlink to the index QMD. What's going to happen behind the scenes, I'll just tell you now, is that each one of these markdowns files will be compiled into an HTML file. And then automatically through this structure, the links to the HTML files will be served up for the web page just behind the scenes. You don't have to worry about the folders or anything. And it just works. It works pretty well. Furthermore, there's a second page um, called about. All right. And it just populates it with some generic language. Down here in this part, you um, set the format of your output and uh, the theme of your output. The, the default theme is one called Cosmo, but I choose, chose those other ones for the reasons I told you. And do you want a table of contents? The table of contents on a markdown website is this, this bar on the right hand side that are also live links that allow you within a page that you've selected to navigate um, through. Uh, for you guys watching remotely, it's this bit over here that's the table of contents. Table of contents is generated automatically if you use headings, and I'll show you how easy the headings are in just a moment. So let's do follow the tutorial. We're gonna have to pick up the speed. Let's say we've got till about 5:30 before, <clears throat> or maybe a bit more if we're if we're close. So um, let's see. I think I've said all of this stuff. I think I have um, <clears throat> gone through our YAML file, so we've done this part. And I think then that I ask to um, open up the index QMD. And um, now, if we look up here on our website. Um, we see that it says that I have edited the YAML file because I changed the name. So I'm just going to, it's in red text up here in this, in this view, and I'm just going to hit control S to save it. And now I'm going to go down here in my files menu, and I'm just going to click on index.qmd. And our interface um, is contextually different now. So uh, we've got a render button. This is the first test for some people of, as to whether you have a new version. Do you get a render button now, George? Restarting, restarting the computer. So it, you have to have to get this. You have to have a recent version of RStudio and Quarto installed for this to work. So uh, if you do get the render button, is anybody following along in here who does have the render button? Got to go see Alex. No problem. You get the render button. OK, yes. All right. So click render if you're ready to go. It's going to compile. Look down in the um, quick. If you're quick, you can look down in the file menu and see some stuff happening and some stuff's coming in. OK, now I get an error message. And uh, what's going on with my error message is that <clears throat> this is one of the, the weird things that um, that um, our, uh, is a problem with Dropbox is that Dropbox version control will grab onto a file and not let it go. And I was creating files and in the process of compiling your HTMLs, the uh, Dropbox will grab onto an intermediate file that's then going to go away and it'll hold on to it. And that's why the error message comes up, I hope. So let's hit render again, three, two, one. It's going to make some files. Look down here in the files. I'm seeing some stuff. And boom, the default is that it sets up a, um, a local web server. You can see that it's the local host. Now, in my experience, um, this part of Quarto is it doesn't work perfectly. And you have an option to change the output file to your viewer window in here. But for me, the uh, I was I was and am doing um, somewhat ambitious stuff with lots of pages and some some R code and moving data around and stuff. 
And so I have found that every once in a while I need to close down my local host and restart my project. And that has fixed the problem every time. It may be because of my Dropbox and maybe because of me trying to hack it and do some weird stuff and poke it until it breaks, which I have broken it a few times. But um, I, it's so resilient that it's amazing. Okay, so I'm going to go back, go back to the, um, go back to the, um, the um, tutorial. We get a rendered website. It looks exactly like our our local hosted website. I did want to show that um, <clears throat> the YAML file by default points to one page, and for us, it's this home page. So if I click on the home page, I get this page. And this is the one that is called. Um, I don't. I haven't yet tested it to where to see whether it's a um, a reserved page name index. But I think you can point it to a file named anything that you wish. But I left it at the default. And of course, we have the about one, which made an automatic different button, and it's just a placeholder file for about. So about about this site. If I open up the files and open up that about QMD, I can change this to, um, you know, my site. <clears throat> I can change this to, you know, hello world, save, render. And we should get a live rendering. And by default, um, the uh, so now it's changed the button automatically to my site. So that's based on the title of your package. And if I click on my site, I get the content. So we just changed. So this is a way that we do it. Let's go back to the um, to the uh, YAML. So um, customizing your YAML is is basically the way to um, to um, to do everything ambitious with a with a website, to make the boot camp and to make the Herring site. In fact, this is what the YAML looks like. The easiest way, if you want to start playing around with different themes, um, is uh, you know I've I've said that I have the um, the uh, options for a light and a dark option. So this is um, that kind of um, in the format options this is what it looks like on on my site after just a little bit of playing but what if we went to the um Porto, um styles options let's see if we can easily get the um the ones and and look uh so the default here that we're using is uh on our quarto file is cosmo and we can see some examples of each of the ones. Let's look up at a, a cyborg sounds stupid. Let's look at that one. Yes, that one looks pretty good. So let's try it. And let's just save it and we'll just render it. And it. Oh, good. For there a second, I thought it was some, um, you know, black text on uh, something, but but it's just that easy to change the rendering. It's uh, it's quite easy and it's fun to play with it. And some of them are conservative and attractive, and some of them are like cyborg. Okay, so let's go back to our um, uh, our server now. Um, now, if you wanted to make a uh, website exactly like mine. Um, now let me see. I've got an index. I've got uh, contents section. So here I've changed the style to docked, and I've I've um, commented out the local logo. So just for giggles, what you could do is uh, copy everything that I've got there. You may not want our stats bootcamp as your um, as your title. I'm going to paste that in, and we're just going to save that. And now I'm going to go to index and hit render. This will change it away from cyborg and change it back to the conservative styles flatly and darkly. So 
So now we've got uh, a new title. We've got the index file changed the website and we've got um, our two themes changed like that. So you can make pretty radical changes with no other substantial changes just by changing the YAML file. I mentioned it before, but um, I, I am shocked still at how, how good the uh, and simple the Quarto website is to be able to, to experiment with the YAML options. <clears throat> okay, so we've, we've played around with that. And we have to do this other little thing that, um, that I mentioned before is to make an empty file called no Jekyll. Now you could go to the folder, right click, uh, create new, new file and name it exactly dot no Jekyll. That would be one way to do it. Or you could um, just use from the ter terminal, copy null dot no Jekyll, which is what I'm gonna do. It's gotta be spelled correctly. So uh, if unsure, triple check. N-O-J-E-K-Y-L-L -L dot no Jekyll. So we should be able to see it um, probably not over here in the uh, files view. We hit go, it says one file was copied and we can just go and double check that it's um, there, which it will be. And there it is. That has to be present, remember, to prevent your GitHub page from, um, from uh, rendering, trying to render Markdown to Jekyll. And, and we don't wanna render anything to Jekyll. That's another little subtlety that I wanted to tell you. It's because GitHub's not rendering anything, we we must, we do have a small burden here. It's a small price to pay, but um, in the process of developing your web page, you'll compile it locally and let Quarto do all the work locally in your directory, and then you're pushing the compiled website straight to GitHub. So um, that's related to the reason we want no Jekyll, no compiling on GitHub, okay? All right, and now the last little bit is to um, is to get this up on GitHub and view our new website, right? So uh, if we look back at our GitHub desktop, we have a lot of changes. You um, have to put a summary. The summary to be anything. It should be informative. So I'm putting hello world first time we're launching this, right? You can put a description if you have a lot of changes or if you're working with other people, you do this. I tend, if it's something that I'm doing for my own benefit or just a small team that I'm in close contact with, I, I probably wouldn't put extensive comments here, um, but it is the safest practice. I'm gonna commit to main, all being well with Dropbox turned off. It's just going to accept everything. It was a very small website we made. Even though it looked like a lot of files, it was almost nothing. And then I'm going to publish the branch. Okay. So now um, <clears throat> I just talked through the interface. I just visually said what we've done, and we've we've published the branch. But now we, we still have to configure our GitHub pages, and it's the last, very last step that we have to do. I, I strategically left this to the last step to give our repository time to um, propagate and, and show up on our GitHub site. But let's go back to your GitHub um, organization. And close all of these repo sites, these uh, local instances. We go back to our our repository within our new organization. And we'll go to settings. Now, um, let me just double check something here because I didn't remember saying it. This is a subtlety that I forgot to say, but it's uh, it's important. And if you followed the tutorial exactly, you would have already um, done this. But uh, if we look in the YAML file, because this is compiled locally, um, the output by default will be in the root directory of your project, right? But often we don't want that. We might for organizational reasons or just keeping it tidy, 
we might want to specify one folder that protects the open to the internet folder for some other stuff. Maybe we're developing pages and we only want to compile pages that are finished that are open to the internet. So the way that we can handle that, the way that Quarto gives us is we have this um, under your projects, we have a field called output dash dir. And uh, I've again just picked this up from the Quarto documentation and it's, I mean, it works so well. I have never seen one of these systems like this be so easy. And what happens is when you compile it, it creates on the fly the output directory for you. And if we look in there, we'll see compiled web pages for index and about, plus um, some other associated files. So some, um, some Java um, code and the style code. And there will also be other um, documents eventually that will accumulate in there, like pictures that you include and embed in your HTML. All right, I forgot to mention that, but um, that's an important point of what we need to do here on our GitHub page settings. So I've clicked on the settings page and we're going to go down to um, to this tab. It's called GitHub pages about halfway down. It's in the um, code and automation section. And it's the last one in that section and just click on it. And uh, we just have to do a couple of um, a couple of settings here. We have to deploy from branch. Uh, let's see. Yes, we're going to deploy from a branch. The branch that we choose is main. There's only one branch, but if you had some development versions of your website, this would be easy to do. We'd always want to deploy from main. If this were a, um, a business website or if this were a professional website and there were more than person than just one person controlling it, or if I would be really, really embarrassed if I made broken links or something, then what I would probably do is I would branch my own repo. I would develop on my development branch, and then I would merge with main when I wanted it to go live. But for just for a personal website, an academic website, an education website that's not too big, I for my workflow, it's fine to, uh, to publish and write from the main branch. Second thing we need to do is we need to go to the um, the root directory and set that. Guess what? We're going to set it to docs because that's the one we want to point to. And then all we have to do is hit save. The last thing that we want to do is um, <laughs> is we can just type in our our repo. Now I've got a little code here for it, but the way that these are set up, I'll show you the um, repository and then we'll look at the live website in a moment is your um, URL for these sites is the name of your um, account. You, and for us, it's the organization name, .github.io forward slash your repository name. Okay, let's just look at how I've chosen to communicate that to you. So, um, <clears throat> so for us, it's the, uh, it's the organization name, .github.io, and if you followed me, website is the repository, okay? So for me, it will be c7041-2022.github.io forward slash website 321. Hello. Ah, this lady over here. <laughs> and there's our website. <laughs> And it works. Let's put it on dark mode. That's it. It works. We have a live website and we did it in even with cup, cupcake consumption and starting 10 minutes late in less than an hour and a half. <laughs> that's that's all that I have today. Any comments or questions? Anybody try and have any problems other than installation problems? The reason we blind though was because the timeline existed, but it just what all it was showing up was the console, not the console.